Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2, verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4, Includes Study Aids. Chapter 5, Gives a Suggested Bible Study Program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This segment is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to do quite a bit of reading because what we want to do is introduce you to a guide that we've come out with on how to study the Bible. It is about uh, 26 or so pages, and you can download it for free on our website. Just go to wordandsword.com slash howto, that's H-O-W-T-O, -O, all one word, wordandsword.com slash howto, and you'll be able to download this as a PDF file and to go through it on your own. But I want to take some time and to go through it with you. And in this segment, we want to simply go through the first chapter that we have in here. And in future episodes, we hope to go through some of the other material, though we may not cover all of it. But we want to go through this and invite you to go and download your own copy and for you to go through it on your own at some point as well. But the first chapter that we have is will to do his will. We want to assist you, if you have a desire to do the will of God, assist you in being effective in your Bible study, to learn to study on your own and to dig into the Word of God that you may know what it is that he would have you to do in your life. And so we want to begin with this on will to do your will. And again, I, I'm going to read through 
uh, quite a bit of this. I may pause here and there, make a few comments, uh, read scripture out of the Bible, though there's scripture uh, quoted in here as well. So we're going to begin now. Jesus said, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. John 7:17. 7, he stated this in the midst of a dispute about the authenticity of his teaching since he had never studied under the rabbis. John 7:15. Some said he is good, others he deceives the people. John 7, verse 12. So the people looked at Jesus and realized that he had not gone through the school of the rabbis. He had not been to the school of the Pharisees or the scribes or anything like that. And so they looked at him as not having authority, not being a genuine teacher. That's how some people viewed him. And so there was a dispute. Others saw him with honesty, that he was a good man sent of God and that his teaching had value and authority in it. So there was these disputes, but the key thing is, if anyone wills to do his will, Jesus said, you'll know the doctrine. You can understand it. And we continue on. As Jesus continued to teach, he issued this admonition. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. John 7, 24. Because Jesus was not from the religiously elite and brought strange things to their ears, many of the Jews had the tendency to reject him without a fair hearing or due consideration. In this condition, the Jews were hopelessly lost. This same thing is true for us today. We can have eyes and ears, but not see and hear. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said this, And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. You know, we need to be careful that our attitude isn't such that we've closed our ears and covered our eyes to the truth. That's what Jesus was warning about there in Matthew 13, 14, and 15. So we have to lay aside the doctrines and commandments of men. For a person to understand the Bible when studying it, he or she must have a heart ready and willing to receive the doctrine of Christ. The Jews of the first century did not have this heart. By long-standing traditions and doctrines of men, they held a warped view of Christ and of His kingdom. They believed it would be a physical kingdom and not a spiritual. In Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, we see this exchange between the Pharisees and Jesus. Now, when He was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, He answered and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. And what Jesus is simply saying is, it's a spiritual kingdom, it's not physical. There's still a lot of people today who are looking for a physical kingdom. But Jesus told the Jews in the first century, that's not going to happen. That it is a spiritual kingdom. Hence, when the Lord came, they turned away because they wanted a physical. Jesus said, no, it's going to be spiritual. He taught them about a kingdom that was not of this world. Remember in John 18, when he was on trial before Pilate, and Pilate asked him if he was the king of the Jews, and Jesus told him this in John 18, verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. His kingdom is not a physical kingdom. But the Jews had covered their eyes, have plugged their ears, so to speak, so that they rejected Jesus. They were not willing to accept the truth that the kingdom was a spiritual kingdom. So what does this mean for us as we think about that attitude and their their rejection? Because they had traditions, they had doctrines of men that they were holding on to. It means that we must set aside all preconceived notions and ideas and all traditions of men and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save our souls. James 1, 21. If we hold to the traditions of our great-great-grandmother in opposition to the revealed will of God, we will be no better than the Jews who rejected the Christ. We may draw near to the Lord with our mouth and honor Him with our lips, but our hearts will be far from Him. Matthew 15, 7 through 9. So what do we need to do? <clears throat> we need to ask and seek and knock. Remember, one with a willing heart will know the truth. Jesus made a promise. In Matthew chapter 5, or rather Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8, he said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. So many people fear that if they do study the Bible, they will not be able to understand it. This is sometimes fostered by preachers who willfully or unwittingly impress people with the idea that only clergy can understand the word. But this is counter to everything the Lord and His apostles taught. Jesus told us to ask and seek and knock. And He promised that if we do that, then we will receive and find and have a door open for us. So if we are diligent about finding the truth, we can. Because the Lord said we could. The Apostle Paul said that things he wrote should be read and would be understood. Notice in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. What Paul writes is he's talking about the blessing that he had to go out and to teach the gospel. Ephesians 3, verse 3. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Think about what the apostle just said. He said, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. We can understand what Paul understood. Now, don't let that word mystery confuse you here because what he's talking about in the context, if you just go read Ephesians 3, he's talking about there were things in times past that weren't revealed that now in the New Testament have been revealed. So what was a mystery has now been revealed. So it's been clarified. It's been made known. And he says, when I write this to you and you read it, you can understand my knowledge, that is Paul's knowledge, in the mystery of Christ. We can understood as the apostle did. There are a lot of people who think that the apostles had some kind of advantage over us, and that's not true. The things that were revealed to them were things they still had to think about and consider and, and mull over, and they came to an understanding through studying the revealed word, just like you and I come to an understanding through the revealed word. And if you think about it, it makes sense. God revealed the Bible, right? God revealed the Bible as it is and made man as he is. 
God's the one who sent the Holy Spirit to reveal all truth through the apostles. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. And then he told the apostles in Mark 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So he says, I'm going to reveal all truth to you. And you go and you preach that truth to every creature. So you go out and you teach people. So God made man and God made the Bible. God revealed his word. And we understand that he told them to go and teach the gospel to every creature because God wants all men to be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, God wants us all to know the truth because it's through knowing the truth, John 8, 32, that we are set free. So again, follow the reasoning here and and understand what God is telling us. Ask, seek, knock. You're going to receive. You're going to find. You're going to have that door open. Because God made the Bible. God made man. God made the Bible for man. Not for some special class of men. Not for just a few to understand and tell everybody else what to believe. But for all of us to go to His Word and to understand His will. To understand His love. To know about the plan of salvation. Now, there's an example in Acts chapter 10 of a man by the name of Cornelius. The Roman centurion had a will to do God's will. In Acts 10 verse 2, it says that Cornelius was a devout man and one who feared God. As an answer to his prayer, God sent Peter to him to teach him God's will. Just read Acts chapter 10. You'll see that account unfold and explain that he wanted to know the will of God and God said, go send for Peter and Peter will tell you all things that you must do. Now, we will not have an angel appear to us and God's not going to send us Peter. He's not going to send an apostle or prophet because they lived in the first century. They're not around today. But his word that was revealed through those men, that those men taught, has been recorded and preserved for us. And in his providence, just as he opened a door for Cornelius, he can open a door and will open a door for us if we will to do his will. It very well could be that you watching this study now, this program now, that that's the door that God has opened for you to learn and to know the truth because you have a will to do His will. You want to please Him. You want to serve Him. You know, the Bible is light. It illuminates the hearts and souls of men. It discerns our thoughts and intents. Hebrews 4 verse 12. We must be willing to approach it so our sins and weaknesses can be exposed. We have to come to the light, as Jesus said in John 3, 19 to 21. In this way, we will know the truth that sets us free. If you are unwilling to do His will, then all the Bible study in the world will not do you any good. If you do not want to do God's will, it doesn't matter what teaching is done, You're going to reject it. You're not going to believe it. You're going to turn away from it. Just like the Jews. There were men who heard Jesus teach. They saw the miracles that confirmed what he was teaching was true. And they still rejected him. Why? Because they did not have a will to do his will. We encourage you, have that will. Have that good heart that you want to do God's will. Whatever it says. So... You can get this lesson and several others by going to our website and downloading this guide on how to study the Bible. Go to wordandsword.com forward slash 
how to. Wordandsword.com forward slash how to, all one word, H O W T O. And please, if we can help you further, reach out and let us know. We continue in our study of the sacrifice of the Son. And when we study about this, when we look at the gospel accounts and what unfolded in the trial, in the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, what we are studying is the most monumental event in all of human history. In fact, it is that on which all of human history hinges. If you go back into the biblical record and look at the history of the world from the creation going forward, it's all leading up to that point. When you think about Adam and Eve and what happened with them, the call of Abraham, the children of Israel going into the land of Canaan, the rise and fall of empires like Babylon and Persia and Greece and then Rome, all of those things were being done and guided by the hand of God to lead to the very moment when the Son of God would give His life on the cross so that men can be forgiven of their sins. So as we study about this, let's understand the weight and the gravity of the events that are unfolding. We want to notice here in Matthew chapter 27, as we continue in this series of studies, we want to notice about the fact that Jesus was crucified on that cross. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 33 to 34, it says this, And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink, but when he had tasted it, he would not drink. The first thing that we want to notice is, when it says he's given the sour wine mingled with gall, this is a narcotic. The Romans, when they would crucify someone, would allow them to take this to sort of numb the pain, to take the edge off of the pain as they were being crucified on a cross. But Jesus refused to take that narcotic. And what we see in this is the fact that he is going to experience the suffering, the pain, the death of the cross as a man. There is no intervention of his divine power or of the Father's power. There's no uh, lessening of the suffering and the pain by any miraculous means. He is experiencing that cross as man, as one of us would experience that cross. And so he refused the narcotic there. Now, if we go to John chapter 19, we notice that he was crucified between two criminals. In John chapter 19, verses 17 and 18, it says, And he, bearing his cross, went to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the center. He was crucified between two criminals from the Roman standpoint, just as a measure of humiliation, or they would view it as humiliation, as well as the Jews would see this as a degrading thing, that he would be there identified with those who were convicted of crimes. Now, Jesus, of course, was not really convicted of a crime. He was convicted of being the king of the Jews. But here he's with common criminals. And so what they're saying is he is the lowest of the low. So there's humiliation in that. But from the divine side, let's understand that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. Prophecy made about 700 years before through Isaiah, when it said he would be numbered with the transgressors. And so we see that fulfillment here as he is crucified between two criminals. Now, one of the things we want to understand is the writers of the Gospels simply say he was crucified. Now, for the people who originally received these letters, there was no need of an explanation as to what that process was and what took place in it. But for you and I who have not witnessed crucifixions like they would have, we maybe don't understand what all is involved in it. 
Of course, when we get to John 20 and you have Thomas who says, unless I see the print of the nails in his hands and I see where he was uh, pierced in his side, he wouldn't believe. So we understand from the gospel accounts that there was the idea of the nailing of the hands and the nailing of the feet to the cross. And that's what would take place. They would have a big wrought iron nail that would go through essentially the wrist and go into the wood where it would hold the victim firmly to the piece of wood. And they would give them a little bit of uh, flex in their knees. And sometimes they would have a little piece of wood where they would be able to rest somewhat on that. But they would have to pull up and down to inhale and exhale. And a cross was designed to extend someone's torture before they died. You know, they could have easily beheaded people, but they didn't. And crucifixion was designed to extend and to um, make it more difficult, more painful through this process. And eventually, the victims usually suffocated to death. But be that as it may, it was a horrible way to die. We want to notice now in Luke chapter 23, the first thing that Jesus said after he was crucified, as Luke's account really gives a more orderly account of things that unfolded, we see Luke 23, 34 as the first words of Jesus speaking from the cross. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The first thing Jesus speaks about is the forgiveness of of the people who are committing this sin. He wanted them to be forgiven. He is here acting as a savior and as an intercessor between sinners and God. So he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But let's also realize that this is not unconditional forgiveness. It's not like Jesus is saying ignore their sin overlook it, don't hold them accountable. That's not what he's saying. When we get to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, we see where there are those who were guilty of crucifying the Son of God that heard the gospel, obeyed the gospel, and were forgiven of their sins. For instance, in Acts 2 verse 22, as Peter's preaching to the Jews, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified, and put to death. So there were those in the audience that day who were guilty of the death of Jesus Christ. When you get down to verse 36, he repeats the same thing. Jesus, whom you have crucified, is Lord in Christ. The men are pricked in the heart. They're cut to the heart. They ask what they need to do. And Peter tells them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And it says that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. So there were people who heard that gospel being preached who responded to it, who had their sins forgiven. That's what Jesus was praying for, that there would be a time, there would be opportunity, that these people would be led to accept Him as Savior and submit to His commands and be forgiven of their sins. That's what He's saying in Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We see in this that if they could be forgiven of killing the Son of God, then you and I can be forgiven of any sin that we have committed. Because I cannot think of any sin that is worse than the murder of the innocent Son of God. And so, whatever we have done, we understand that God's willing to forgive us. Jesus is there suffering on the cross, and there are people around Him who are making fun of him and ridiculing him. And he's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What a beautiful picture that is of our Savior, that as he is going through the most difficult, painful suffering of his life on earth, that he is thinking about the well-being 
and the salvation of others. And he's thinking about your salvation and my salvation even now. Now we'll come back in just a few moments and we'll look at what's happening with Jesus as he's hanging on the cross and what people are saying around him. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible. So you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning his will and submitting to his commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth, Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. We pick up now in John chapter 19, where we see that Jesus was treated with great contempt while he was hanging on the cross. In John 19, we pick up in verse 19. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Therefore the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but... He said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, this title that was put on the cross was written in three different languages because of the different uh, people who would be there and different purposes. So, it's written in Hebrew because that's the local language. It's written in Greek because it is the international language, sort of like English is today. Greek was that back in the first century. And then it was written in Latin because that was the official language of Rome or the legal language, if you will. But this title is put there because it showed the crime of which the victim had been convicted. So Pilate is declaring to the world that Jesus was convicted and condemned to death for being the king of the Jews. And the reason they would do this is so that people who walked by could read 
what someone was guilty of and be deterred from doing the same thing because they would see, well, that's going to be me if I do the same thing as that person who's hanging on a cross. Well, the Jews did not like that Pilate put Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. So they go and they appeal to him and want him to change it to say, he said, I am king of the Jews. In other words, they want to take away the idea that Jesus was indeed the king of the Jews. But Pilate stood firm on this. It's what they had pressured him over in order to get him to put Jesus to death. Remember at his trial when they were getting nowhere with Pilate and Pilate kept declaring him to be innocent, that the Jews said, you know, we have no king but Caesar, and if you let this go, you're not Caesar's friend. So Pilate convicted him for being king of the Jews and therefore had him executed. But be that as it may, while he is there, and this sign is there for everybody to read, in verses 23 and 24, let's notice this. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. You think about how sad this picture is, that Jesus is there hanging on the cross and suffering, and the soldiers are dividing up his earthly possessions. We know Jesus was poor that he told his disciples that foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not have anywhere to lay his head. So he was poor as far as this world's goods were concerned, and here these soldiers are dividing up his earthly possessions because as a part of their job, they would be able to keep the things or the possessions of the condemned. They would either keep it themselves or go and sell it in the marketplace. And so that's what these soldiers are participating in here. And it says, this was done that the scripture might be fulfilled. This is a quote out of Psalm 22. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, how did David know to write that very specific detail down a thousand years before Jesus came into the world. And the way that he knew it, of course, was that it was by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And what implication does that have? What it tells us is that God knew and God planned all along for his son to be rejected of the Jews and to be put on that cross so that he would give his life and shed his blood for the sins of mankind. And with this detail here, it gives us great assurance in the scripture and God's plan of salvation that not the smallest detail would go unfulfilled. And so what God had planned all along before time began is being fulfilled here. And we can trust in that and have confidence in Jesus as our Savior because he did fulfill that prophecy. But we go on and notice this over in Matthew chapter 27. In Matthew 27, we want to read where the Jews who are there, the leaders and others, are walking by the cross and they are ridiculing Christ as he's hanging there. So his garments are being divided up among the soldiers. And here's what else is happening in Matthew 27 beginning in verse 39. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. 
He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So Jesus is there, having been beaten, having been put on the cross, nailed to that wood. He's suffering, he's bleeding out, he's struggling to breathe. And the people are going by and taunting him as he's hanging there. And notice something that they say. You know, they're saying, if you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. The scribes and elders in verse 42 said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he is, if he is the King of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. Okay? They are saying, here's how you can prove you're the Son of God. Come down off of that cross. So their plan was to prove Jesus as the Messiah that he would need to come off the cross. God's plan to prove that Jesus was the Messiah was for him to stay on that cross. You see how men look at it one way and God looks at it another? How men come up with their own plan of salvation and God has his plan of salvation? Just as we would reject the Jews in saying Jesus needed to come off the cross, we need to reject every other teaching out there regarding how men can be saved, how men can go to heaven that is not found in the Word of God. So they are there making fun of him and ridiculing him and blaspheming him, as the text says. In Luke 23, it tells us that the soldiers were also there mocking him and making fun of him. Now, Jesus had the ability to come down off of the cross. He had the power to do that. If he had exercised divinity, he could have come off of that cross. He could have destroyed those men and cast them into hell to suffer forever. But he didn't do that. He did not exercise divine power, but he is here suffering fully as a man on that cross, again, to give himself for the sins of the world in order that you and I might realize salvation when we come to him. So we're going to pause there for just a second and come back in just a minute and notice in Luke chapter 23 where Jesus and the robbers who are crucified with him have an exchange and an interaction. And notice in that text how that what's written there is different than what people will try to get you to believe. So come back in just a moment in Luke 23. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the Word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the Word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study 
It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to that's word and sword dot com forward slash how to let's now look in luke twenty three in what's commonly called the account of the thief on the cross and many people have heard about the thief on the cross and they've been taught that we can look here for god's plan of salvation how can one be saved? And they would point us to the thief as an example of that. Well, we want to examine that and notice what the text is teaching and what it is not teaching. So let's dig into it in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, the first thing we want to note here is that there's a criminal here who's blaspheming Jesus. Remember, we read before in Matthew 27 that both the robbers joined in with the crowd that was there in ridiculing and blaspheming Jesus as he was hanging on the cross. And now in this account, it tells us that sometime later, one of them again blasphemes Jesus, but the other one has had a change of heart. Now, what's shocking to me at this point is that here is a criminal who is suffering and about to meet his maker. He's about to pass from this life into the next, and that has not humbled him or sobered up his thinking in any way. You know, usually people, when they go through suffering and a trial that is similar or of the same nature, and especially when they go through it together, they have some type of bond. They have some type of mutual compassion and um, appreciation and um, connection together. You know, uh, people who have had children that have had childhood cancers, and they've had to go with their children through, you know, if it's leukemia and treatments of that, and then another one has a child that has brain cancer, and they have to go through all the, the trauma and trial of that, that even though those two people don't have the same exact situation, even though their children may be different ages, and even though it may be a few years apart, they have a kinship together. And if they are there together at the hospital at the same time, and they're seeing the same doctors and, and going through the similar treatments, or maybe they both have leukemia and they're going through that, that makes that bond that much tighter, and you have compassion for the other person. And it's even true where people who were once at enmity with one another, that if they are all of a sudden put into a trial together, and they suffer along with one another, they can come out on the other side as very close friends. So it, it's amazing here that this criminal is so hardened in his heart, so corrupt, 
that he continues to blaspheme Jesus. The other one has come to his senses. The other one has sobered up. The other one has rethought the situation and he's changed his mind as we see here. Now, when he appeals to the Lord, he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, there is a religion out there, the Jehovah's Witnesses, that say what Jesus is stating here is that today I am telling you, you will be with me at paradise at some point in the future. Because Jehovah's Witness believe, they're taught, they believe, they promote, that when you die, you don't exist. When your body dies, that you go into oblivion. And you only exist in the mind of God. And so they say there's nothing there after death. Well, Jesus is not saying, you know, that this thief is just going into nothingness. And then one day he's going to be with him in paradise. What he's telling him is that today you will be with me in paradise. That both Jesus and the thief would leave this world. They would cross from this life into the next. They would go from this life into the Hadean realm. And they would be together. Now he describes this place as paradise here. Over in Luke chapter 16, when Jesus teaches about the rich man and Lazarus, and he tells us that the rich man died and he awoke in torments, and Lazarus died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom, that Abraham's bosom is a place of peace and rest. That is what he tells us is described as paradise here in Luke 23. So Abraham's bosom and paradise a place of peace and comfort are one and the same in the Hadean world. Now, just to clarify, remember the Hadean world is the realm of the dead where our souls go when we die and leave this world. And that Hadean world consists of three parts. In Luke 16, it tells us there's the torments where the rich man was. There is the bosom of Abraham where Lazarus went. And in between those two is a great gulf. And that gulf cannot be passed from one direction to the other. Either way, you can't go from paradise over to torments or torments over into paradise. But be that as it may, Jesus says to this thief that today you will be with me in paradise. They would be together on the other side just as they were together there suffering next to one another. Now, the question comes up, well, how was the thief saved? And there are people who are going to point to this passage and they're going to say, well, the thief was saved by faith alone and that's a pattern for you and I to be saved today. Well, I want to submit to you that this thief, whatever faith he had, and I agree he had faith, but whatever faith he had did not develop while he was there hanging on the cross. His faith came at some other time or was based on some other experience in his life. And follow with me and let's understand this. First of all, in James chapter 2, James chapter 2, we want to understand that the faith alone doctrine is not biblical. It is against the Word of God to teach that we are saved by faith alone. Now notice in James chapter 2 verse 24, you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Now that works there is not the idea that we work to earn our place before God, we work to earn our salvation, our forgiveness or anything like that. What he's talking about in the context as he cited the example of Abraham in offering up Isaac is he's saying when you obey God's command, no matter how difficult, no matter how challenging it may be, that you in faith do the will of God. You work the works of righteousness. When you do that, when you're submissive to the Lord, then you are justified. 
Because if you're not submissive to the Lord, you're not justified. You're in rebellion toward Him. So, he says again, James 2.24, You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So the thief wasn't saved by faith alone. But we know that he did indeed have faith. He had faith that was developed at some point in his life that evidently he pushed aside, but now as he's hanging next to Jesus, he comes back to it. Now, think about this. In Romans chapter 10, Romans 10 verse 17, it tells us this. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So how is it that faith comes? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In other words, faith is developed when we hear God's word. Now that may be we read it or we hear somebody teaching it to us. But through the word of God, we come to an understanding that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We're convicted of that, and that is faith. And that faith needs to lead us on to serve God, to obey God, to submit to Him as we talked about a moment ago. But while the thief is on the cross, there's no teaching being done. You think about that. The apostles are not standing around the cross and preaching to people, that man hanging on the cross there behind us is the Son of God. They're not there. They're not doing any teaching, any preaching. Jesus is not doing any teaching and preaching on the cross. Now, he's speaking from the cross, and there are things that he says from the cross, but he's not doing any teaching. He's not calling men to believe in him and to serve him at this point. Now, there's no miracle that's going on here. Remember in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, Jesus told the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, in Mark 16, verse 20, it says this, as they went out teaching, notice what it says, Mark 16, verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. He performed miracles through the apostles to verify that what they were teaching was the word of God, was the message of God, was the message of salvation. They didn't just come up with this doctrine, this philosophy, this religious movement on their own. No, they were under the divine authority of Jesus Christ. And the miracles proved that. The miracles supported, confirmed the teaching that they were doing. Now, while Jesus is on the cross and the thief is hanging next to him, there's no teaching being done. There's no miracles being performed to confirm that teaching. So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That process is not unfolding here. That's not happening. So it's not like the man before he got there had never heard of Jesus, didn't know anything about him, didn't believe in him. And while he's hanging there and he looks over at the man next to him, that all of a sudden he comes to an understanding, that's the Lord and Savior hanging next to me. Because all evidence at this point says that Jesus is rejected of God. That's why the scribes, the elders, the people who are there, the soldiers, everybody else who's there who's looking at Jesus are ridiculing him and blaspheming him because it looks like he's been rejected of God, that he is a fraud, that he is a liar, that he is a failure, that he has no power. That's what it looked like to everyone around, if you were just to look at it with human eyes, if you were just to observe what was going on, it looked like Jesus was a fraud. So this man did not come to believe in him as Lord when he was hanging next to him on the cross. Now, let's go to Matthew chapter 3. And answer this question, how 
how could it be that this man was able to hang next to Jesus and to identify him as Lord when previously that he was hanging there on the cross and he had blasphemed him, he had ridiculed him. Well, I submit to you that he heard teaching about Jesus or from Jesus at some point prior to that, at some point in the past. Remember that John, the cousin of Jesus, who was his forerunner, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah, that he was teaching throughout the land of Judea. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6. It says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him, and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So what the text is telling us is that there are thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people who heard the teaching of John the Immerser, who believed in that teaching, and then submitted to that teaching, being baptized, it says here, in the Jordan. And remember, in Mark chapter 1, Mark 1 it tells us about the baptism of John. It says there in Mark chapter 1 that he went and he baptized the people. And it says that he was preaching in verse 4, Mark 1 verse 4, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. They were looking forward to that remission of sins. Now, when they were baptized under John's baptism, let's be clear, their sins were not forgiven at that point because the blood of Christ had not yet been shed. And so it was looking forward to that remission of sins. But here's the point. They were hearing that teaching and they were being baptized. And remember what John had told the people. In John chapter 1, John chapter 1, the book of John, of course, being written by the Apostle John, but he's giving us a record of John the Immerser or John the Baptizer as he's out teaching others. It says in John 1 verse 29, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In chapter 1 verse 34, and I've seen and testified that this is the Son of God. John was preaching, preparing the way for the kingdom. He was preparing the way for Christ, the King as well. And he was preaching Christ as the Son of God, as the Lamb of God, as the Messiah. That's what John was doing. And he was telling people that. Could it be that this man who's there hanging next to Jesus on the cross, had heard that teaching of John. And whether he submitted to it then, or whether he just simply heard it and walked away from it, that now while he's hanging on the cross, he remembers that teaching and he makes the connection. And as he's about to go meet his maker, he has a change of heart and he believes in Jesus as the Son of God. And then something else we need to notice in John chapter 4, John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, Jesus made more disciples than John. So there were people who were hearing the teaching of Jesus that were baptized under that teaching and following him at least for some time. If you fast forward over to John chapter 6 where Jesus fed the 5,000, and remember that 5,000 was 5,000 men beside the women and children. So some have estimated 10,000 or more people were hearing that teaching Jesus was doing on that occasion. But here's the thing. Remember after Jesus was teaching the people the next day, that they rejected what he had to say. They, they followed him the day before. They glorified him the day before. But when they heard some truth they did not like, they could not accept, they turned away from him. In John 6, verse 66, it says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. 
See, Jesus taught many people. In Luke chapter 10, it tells us that he sent out the 70. So think about this. Could the thief just possibly have been one of the people who heard Jesus teach and turned away from his teaching at some point, whether it was John 6 or some other point, that he heard him, he obeyed him, he was devoted to him at one time, but he fell back into his worldly ways. But now, hanging on the cross next to him, he has a change of heart, he has a change of mind, he repents of his sin, and he appeals to the Lord on this occasion for mercy. Could that possibly be the case of how he, at this point, came to confess Jesus as Lord in Luke 23 when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, he knew about the kingdom. He knew Jesus would have a kingdom. He knew he would establish a kingdom. He knew that he was a king. How did he know all of that? If this was the first time that he had ever heard of or known of Jesus of Nazareth. You see, there was some kind of teaching, some type of learning that had to have taken place before this because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Did he have faith? Yes, he absolutely had faith. But it wasn't a faith that was developed right there hanging next to Jesus on the cross. Now, something else we want to notice. In Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, we have an account early on in the ministry of Jesus where there are some friends carrying a man who is paralyzed. And they try to get him in to see Jesus, but Jesus being in the house and a huge crowd around that house, they could not make their way in. So they went up to the roof and dug up the tiles of the roof and let the man down in front of Jesus. And Jesus said this in Mark 2 verse 5, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes, the Jewish leaders, were there saying, you know, Jesus blasphemes. But Jesus puts this challenge to them. And he says, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went out of the place or in the presence of them all, so that all who were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Jesus had power on earth to forgive sins, and he gives proof of that. He declared it as something nobody could see or test or verify. And so he says, to prove the unseen, I'm going to do something you can see. And so he told the man to get up and walk, and what they could see proved what they could not see. That just as he had power to uh, give that man the ability to walk, he had the power to forgive sins. The Son of Man had power or authority on earth to forgive sins. He could do that. And so in Luke chapter 23, when he tells this thief who's hanging next to him, today you will be with me in paradise, Jesus had the authority to forgive sins on the spot while he was on earth. Now, something else we need to notice. In Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, Remember what it says there in verses 16 and 17. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So here's the, the point. That before Jesus died, the New Testament or the New Covenant was not in effect. He was preparing for it. He was teaching people. He was getting them ready for it. But it was not in effect. It was only in effect after his death. And so we understand that the thief was not under that covenant. When Jesus told him, you will be with me in paradise today, you will be with me in paradise, he wasn't under that covenant. So here's the final and full point of it. We are not under the same circumstances and conditions as that thief. So we can't look to him as an example or a pattern of how to be saved. 
We can't look at him any more than we can look at Abraham or Noah or Moses or David or anybody else before the cross in how to be saved. We have to look after the cross, after his covenant went into effect. After Jesus ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles into all truth, that's where we look. And so if we look in Acts 2 and Acts 8, we look in Acts chapter 18, we look in Acts chapter 22, we look at Romans 6, we look at Galatians 3, we look at 1 Peter 3, all those places teaching us we have to believe, we have to repent, we have to confess Jesus as the Christ, and we have to be baptized to be saved. That's what we need to look at in the new covenant, not the thief on the cross. He cannot be used as our pattern of salvation. Jesus came to this earth to give his body and to shed his blood so that our sins can be forgiven. It was something the Father planned before time began, that the Son fulfilled when He came in the fullness of time, that the Holy Spirit revealed in His Word through the apostles and prophets that we have today as a record that we can know about the sacrifice of the Son and what that means to us. It ought to convict us. It ought to cause us to be motivated and dedicated to Him. And if we can help you to be a servant of the Lord, then please reach out and let us know. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible, so you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning His will and submitting to His commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, How that by revelation He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include Chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will. Chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth. Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, you can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash how to that's word and sword dot com forward slash how to we continue in our series of studies in first peter we are in chapter three for this particular study and we'll recall just very briefly about the context of what's going on in the book the letters being written to Christians who are facing great trials and suffering in their life. They're being admonished to remember who they are and that they have a commitment to God, that they need to be separate from the world. 
Peter has told them about relationship responsibilities, the relationship that they have toward government or toward their employers, and it's put in the master-slave context there, and the relationship that they have as husbands and wives and how they are to be committed to those relationships and acting honorably so that they have a great impact on their spouse to help their spouse to get to heaven. And in chapter 3, the latter part, 13 to 22, which we plan to study in this segment, is focusing on the fact that we're going to suffer for what is right. And then he gives us an example of suffering for what is right in Christ Jesus. So let's begin in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13. Let's read down through 17 to start our study together. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, Those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So, first of all, let's notice that Peter is not teaching Christians cannot be harmed if they do good. Because some people read verse 13 there and say, and who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? And some think, well, if I just do God's will, then nothing bad is going to happen to me in life. And that's not what Peter is talking about. What he's talking about is ultimately no real harm is done to the Christian as they remain committed to Christ. So think of it this way. Uh, When you look back into the New Testament, you see where many different faithful disciples of Christ suffered tremendously at the hands of the enemies of the cross of Christ. Think about Stephen in Acts chapter 7, how he preached against the Jewish leaders, how he condemned them for the rebellion against God, and they took him and stoned him to death. Think about Peter and the other apostles being arrested on multiple occasions, being beaten in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 12, James was beheaded. Peter was put in prison and the intent was to behead him as well. But he escaped by the power of God. So you look into the scriptures and you see where people who were devoted to the Lord did suffer. They were doing good and harm came to them. So how do we reconcile what Peter said with what we see unfold in the historical record? And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? He's already told them, and we've already mentioned, he's writing a letter to people who are suffering. And he's preparing them for more suffering that's ahead because of their commitment to the Lord. The whole letter is about Christians and facing suffering, facing harm, if you will. The point is, in the end, what men can do doesn't affect or touch what's truly valuable to the Christian. And that is their soul. If you remember in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul addresses the same kind of issue. In Romans 8 verse 31, notice what he says here. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Well, the obvious answer is, well, Satan can be against us. Those who are under Satan's sway can be against us. But Paul is making this point in Romans chapter 8, really ultimately Who can stand against us if God is with us? And the answer is no one. No one can do us any real harm or damage. So let's keep reading in Romans 8 to see how Paul discusses this issue. He who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? 
It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Paul, like Peter, is saying as we serve God faithfully, that people cannot ultimately do us any real harm. Yes, they may be able to affect the body. They may be able to persecute us and hurt us physically, maybe hurt us economically, financially. They may be able to do those kinds of things, but they cannot touch our soul. They cannot rob us of our relationship with God. The only one who can do damage to that is us as we give it up, as we give in, as we turn away from God. But Peter and Paul are both teaching the same thing, that ultimately no real harm will come to the child of God. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 28, or verse 28, he said that we're not to fear him who can kill the body, but we are to fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. So we need to fear God and not man because man cannot ultimately do anything to us. Now notice again back in 1 Peter chapter 3, he says, Who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? That idea of followers there is literally imitators. Imitators of what is good. Applying what is revealed in the word of God to our lives. That's how we become imitators of what is good. It requires a conformity to the truth, a commitment to the cause of Christ. There are people who want to give lip service about the scriptures, about how they appreciate the scriptures, how they love the truth. But it's one thing to say they love the truth. It's another thing to actually apply it and live by it in your life. And when we follow the truth, when we follow what is good, then we will be in conflict with the world around us. And that's why he says in verse 14, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. And this is so very interesting, you know, being blessed for suffering being blessed because you're committed to Christ even though you're going through this great pain, this great trial. Jesus taught the same thing in Matthew chapter 5 when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember what he said at the end of the Beatitudes there? In Matthew 5 and beginning in verse 10, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you... When they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. See, you're blessed if you suffer for the cause of Christ. Now, Peter said, even if you do suffer, you're blessed. And he followed it up with this admonition. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Now maybe in your Bible, you have that last phrase put off in quotes. That's because it's from the Old Testament. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. And we find that quote originally in Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. And what we have in the background and what's going on is 
the Assyrian Empire is moving west across the Asian continent there, and they're subduing nations as they go along. Now, the nation of Syria and the northern kingdom of Israel wanted the southern kingdom, Judah, to join with them and go and fight against Assyria, the empire that's moving in, the invaders. But Judah refused to go fight with them, to join them to go against Assyria. So Syria, the nation, and Israel, the northern kingdom, threatened Judah, decided they would go and fight and attack Judah because Judah wouldn't join them. They're going to try to force Judah to join them. So the Lord sent Isaiah to King Ahaz, king of Judah, to tell him, do not be afraid of them. And notice here in Isaiah chapter 8, and let's read verses 10, 11, and 12. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes. Whoops, I'm in the wrong place. Chapter 8, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 10. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. He says, The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. You see, Israel, the northern kingdom, and the nation of Syria were conspiring together to go against Judah, the southern kingdom. And the message the prophet delivers to the king and to the nation is don't be afraid of their threats or be troubled. Let Jehovah be your fear. Trust in Jehovah God. No matter what they're saying, no matter how they may threaten you. And that's the message Peter is giving to Christians who are facing suffering for doing good. Notice again, 1 Peter chapter 3, that he says, Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Now notice verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So sanctify Christ as Lord. And what that really means is, in your heart, in your mind, set aside Christ as your master. Have him as a special, in a special place in your mind. And really view him that he has the right to govern your life in all areas of your life. That you do not uh, have authority over yourself absolutely. That is, the Lord has authority over you. And you are to submit to that authority. You're responsible for your actions, for your behaviors. But the Lord is the one that has authority in your life. So you must submit to his rule. And it says, sanctify Christ as Lord. That's the idea of submitting to him as Jehovah God, as almighty God in your life. Just as Ahaz and the nation of Judah were to trust in the Lord while being threatened, we are to trust in the Lord while we are threatened by the enemy and we have to defend our beliefs as people would challenge those as people would oppose those we need to defend our con our convictions about the truth you know we will be persecuted by others for our beliefs and for our behavior and we need to stand up and notice that he says specifically to always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. You think about things that people might ask a Christian. You think about that in the first century 
and maybe some in the, in the 21st century. But why would you be willing to suffer like this for your beliefs? Why would you be willing to put up with the mistreatment? Why don't you just give up? Why is it that you turn away from the things of the world and deny the pleasures that the world has to offer you, the popularity that you could have if you would just go along with the ways of the world? Well, the reason is that we have a hope of a better life and a greater reward that is ahead of us. And I want us to think about this, that he says a reason for the hope that is in you. Christianity is a reasonable, a logical religion. It's based on logic and reason. It is for someone who is thoughtful and reflective that they would think about, meditate upon the teachings of Christ and his apostles and be convicted that those things are true, not a blind faith, but a reasoned faith. A faith that is based on logic and understanding, based on the evidence that is revealed in the Word of God. So be ready to present a defense of what led you to believe in Jesus as the Christ. Why you believe He is the only way to heaven. That's what Peter is urging people to do. Now, the question comes up, are we required to answer every question that anybody asks us ever? The short answer to that is no. We're not required to answer every single question. You think about Jesus when he was on trial before the Jews. There were many questions that he refused to answer. And when he went on trial before Herod, he didn't say a word before him. When he was on trial before Pilate, there were questions that he would not answer. He would not respond, even to the point that Pilate marveled and wondered why Jesus wasn't speaking up and why he wasn't defending himself. And you recall in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6, that Jesus says, Don't cast your pearls before the swine. Don't give what is holy to the dogs. And what he's saying is there are times when We shouldn't engage with other people. In fact, in Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, we're specifically told not to engage in things that are harmful. In Titus chapter 3 verse 9, But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable, and useless. You see, there are some questions that are harmful. You know, some people say, well, there's no stupid question. We we understand the meaning of that. What they're saying is if you are honestly seeking answers, you're honestly seeking the truth, and in that context there's no stupid questions. But you know what? There are some people who are not seeking truth. They're not seeking to honor God. Some questions are designed to entrap people, to entrap a believer, to make them look foolish and the truth to look foolish. They're designed to confuse others who are listening and to try to turn them away from the truth to get them to doubt the truth. Just like the devil asked the question of Eve, you know, has God truly said you're not not to eat of every tree? You know, the devil can use questions to either get us or others to turn against God or to get the truth to look bad and to turn things around. So some people are just dishonest and dishonorable with their questions. So we have to be careful about that. But generally speaking, when people ask us about what we believe, they're sincere, they're honest, they want to know the truth, we need to honor God in answering that question. We need to believe in and defend the integrity of truth and think about the souls of others. As Jesus says, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So we need to answer honest questions and explain why we believe what we believe and why we behave how we behave. He says we are to answer these questions again, 1 Peter 3 verse 15 with meekness and fear. 
You know, meekness is the idea of power under control. And we need to have our tempers reined in because sometimes in disputes over truth and disagreements, people can lose control of their temper and they get ugly and harsh and mean. And we can't do that when we're speaking up and defending and representing truth. We're not trying to prove that we are right, not trying to prove the other person is wrong. What we're trying to do is reason out the truth and help them and help us, frankly, to understand the will of God. So when he says to answer with meekness and fear, having that power under control, and as we studied before, a fear of God, not of man. Never fear man, but fear God and respect Him, knowing that we are accountable to Him. So in verse 16 then, wrapping this up, he says, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Having a good conscience. Behave and speak and answer in a way that gives you a clear conscience. You're not ashamed of how you've conducted yourself when you're under pressure. Others may accuse you, but when they observe your good conduct, they are the ones that are ashamed instead of you being ashamed. For it is better, he says, if it's the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. It's God's will that we do good. And there are times that as a consequence of doing that, we will suffer. So God would is okay and accepts and allows us to suffer for doing good. And that's fine. We don't want to suffer for doing evil right? But we deserve the suffering for doing evil. When we do good and suffer, God looks on that favorably. And so it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. When we come back in our next segment, we're going to look at verses 18 to 22 as we have an example of suffering for doing good. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. To build that relationship, you need to open God's Word and discover what He desires for you. You need to know for yourself what pleases Him. The religions of men have created confusion about this. They have taught people two very destructive ideas. First, they say, you do not have anything to do, so you don't need to study the Bible. Second, you cannot understand the Bible. So you don't need to study, but are forced to accept their interpretation of the word. In Philippians 2 verse 12, the word of God says, work out your own salvation. You can do this not by earning anything from God, but simply by learning his will and submitting to his commands. Ephesians 3, 3 and 4 say, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. In other words, you can understand the gospel of Christ just as Paul understood it. We want to help you learn to study for yourself. Our guide on how to study the Bible will do this and is available to download for free at wordandsword.com forward slash how to. This quick and simple guide will help you learn the basic principles of effective Bible study. It will help clear up confusion and free you from the traditions of men and provide you with a solid foundation in God's Word. The lessons include chapter 1, A Will to Do His Will, chapter 2, Rightly Divide the Word of Truth, Chapter 3, It is Written Again. Chapter 4 includes study aids. Chapter 5 gives a suggested Bible study program. Our guide is a primer, a beginning point, that we pray will get you started on your personal journey to a better understanding of God's Word, free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Again, You can download it for free right now at wordandsword.com forward slash 
how to. That's wordandsword.com forward slash how to. Let's now look at 1 Peter 3 verses 18 to 22 as Peter gives us an example of suffering for doing good. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom he also went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. You know, Christ suffered for doing good and triumphed in the end. And that's the message Peter is sending to those who would be devoted to Christ. You will suffer for serving Christ, but in the end, you will be triumphant over the enemy. Notice that he says in verse 18 that Jesus suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. He, of course, was without sin, as Hebrews 4.15 says, that he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. He suffered for us for our sins, so that we could be forgiven. You remember in Luke 23, 34, the first words of Jesus from the cross were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was there giving his life, shedding his blood, so that we could benefit and be forgiven of our sins. And in 1 Peter 3, 18 again, it says, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Other translations talk about being raised in the Spirit. So there's a contrast here between flesh and Spirit. And what this is setting up for us, or what it's explaining to us, is Jesus died. He had that physical body that died on the cross that was put into that grave. But then he was resurrected and he had a spiritual body, if you will. It was a bodily resurrection, but it was a spiritual body. Like Paul talks about, if you remember 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the great resurrection chapter. And Paul explains this, 1 Corinthians 15, 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And in the context, what he's talking about is this fleshly body we live in now versus the resurrection body we're going to have then. And the Bible teaches that when the Lord returns, we will see him as he is and we will be as he is. That's the idea. We're going to ha be resurrected and we're going to go on and to be in heaven with him. That is those who, of course, have been faithful to him. But here's the idea. Jesus was put to death in the flesh, made alive in in the spirit and in verse 19 then it says by whom or some translations have in which he also went and preached to the spirits in prison now here's the thing that gets people tripped up sometimes and there's a religion out there that really turns this around um, the question is did jesus go to the hadean world and go over to the side of torments and preach to people there to try to get them to accept him and thereby they would be delivered out of torments over to paradise into Abraham's bosom. And the answer to that is no. That's not what this is saying. If you look at the context, you will see exactly what he is saying. He says in verse 19 again, he also went and preached to the spirits in prison. That's the spirits in prison at the time that Peter is writing, not previously 
when Jesus went into the Hadean world, but the spirits who were in prison, uh, he says, who were formerly disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, he's talking about these individuals who were disobedient in Noah's day. See, he's, he's being very specific here. In Noah's day, these people were disobedient to God. They were unrighteous. And he says the Lord preached to them. Well, how did he do that? Second Peter chapter 2, remember this? Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5, It did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight, a preacher of righteousness. See, the Lord, through Noah, preached to the people of Noah's day, trying to get them to repent so that they would get on the ark with Noah and his family and be delivered from that judgment. That's what he's talking about here. And notice Ephesians chapter 2. I want to show another similar instance in the New Testament where it talks about Jesus preaching, but he did it through the agency of a man. He didn't go and personally directly preach to these individuals. In Ephesians chapter 2, remember here it's talking about in verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body. And so he's talking about Christ reconciling both Jew and Gentile to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came, this is Ephesians 2.17 now, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. Well, the church at Ephesus was started long after Jesus Christ was on the earth and ascended back into heaven. But it says that he went and preached to them. How did he do that? He did that through the Apostle Paul and his companions that went and spread the gospel in Ephesus. So very similarly to that, in 1 Peter 3, when it talks about that Jesus went and preached to the spirits who were in prison, who formerly were disobedient in the days of Noah, it's talking about Jesus, through Noah, preaching to the people then, trying to get them to repent and turn to God. But, verse 20 again, 1 Peter 3, verse 20. These souls were disobedient when, it says, the divine long-suffering was there, waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved. Few were saved in Noah's day. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, eight people total. The implication is there were thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions or more who perished in that flood. Very few survived that flood. And the implication is, and what Peter's really driving at, is few are going to be saved now. And we want to be included in that few so don't be ashamed, don't give up, be willing to suffer, and in the end, you will be delivered from that judgment. Now, question, how did the ark save Noah? Because Peter says here, in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water, how did the ark save him? The ark was being prepared to deliver him. And the way that happened is through Noah's faithful obedience. In Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews 11 verse 7, you remember what it says of Noah there? By faith Noah, being divinely born of things not yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness which is according to faith, he prepared an ark for the saving of his household. If you go back to the Genesis chapter 6 account, Genesis 6, where Noah's been told to build this ark, he's been given the dimensions, he's been told the animals are going to be put into that ark and all of that. In Genesis 6.22, make note of this. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. So again, the question, how did the ark save Noah? 
And the way that the ark saved Noah is God gave instructions. Noah followed those instructions, right? That's how the ark saved him. Now, how does baptism save us? Because we go back to 1 Peter 3. Notice again, verse 20 the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, and so on. It says, you know, Noah, through the ark and the water, was saved, was delivered from the judgment. And now it's saying, you know, baptism, the light figure, baptism, now saves us. In the same way that the ark save Noah through water, so baptism saves us through water. Remember Colossians 2, verse 11. Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, but putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, through faith, or in which you are also raised with him, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And here's what it is. Just as there were instructions given to Noah, he followed them, he was delivered. There are instructions given to us and how we are to be saved. We follow those and we will be saved. We'll be delivered from that judgment, if you will. There was no power in the ark in and of itself. There was no power in the flood waters in and of themselves. But when Noah obeyed the divine command to build that ark and get in that ark, he got in it. And in the ark, he was delivered as that ark floated on those flood waters. So instructions from God obedient compliance by Noah, he was delivered. God gives us instructions to believe and to be baptized. And when we follow those, then we are delivered as well. Baptism doth also now save us. The power is in the submission to God. It's not in the water. It wasn't in the ark. It's not in the water now. It is in submission to the will of the Father in heaven. And so we see that water in Noah's day separated the righteous from the unrighteous. The same water that caused that boat to float was the water that destroyed all life on earth. That is the breathing animals and men on the earth. The water doomed those who were disobedient. And baptism now does the same thing. It divides those who will be saved from those who will not be saved. You know, water dooms the disobedient. Those who refuse to be baptized for the remission of their sins will not have their sins forgiven. But those who do, their sins are forgiven. Now, we understand they need to go on and live a faithful and true life to the Lord, because our judgment is still ahead of us. But we understand that if we are not baptized, then our sins are not going to be forgiven. Water saves the obedient. And notice Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews 5 and verse 9, where it says this, And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. We have to obey the Lord in order to be saved. And notice what he says here again back in 1 Peter chapter 3. He says that this baptism is not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's, or some translations have the appeal of a good conscience toward God. Either way is true. It's the answer of a good conscience that I believe what the Lord has said. I accept that. I don't resist it. I don't argue against it. I don't excuse it away. But I simply submit to God's will. The appeal is, from that perspective, when I'm baptized, I'm asking the Lord to forgive me of my sins. As Ananias said to Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, as he was known then, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
So when we go down into the waters of baptism, we are making, we are, have a, a conscience that's answering God's call to us and His commands, and a conscience that is appealing to Him for the forgiveness of our sins. And it says here that all of this hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection gives baptism power. Just go to Romans 6 sometime and notice what Paul writes there at the beginning of the chapter about baptism as it relates to the resurrection of Christ. That we're dead in sin, we're buried, we are raised up. Just, you know, following the figure of Jesus being buried and being raised. But be that as it may, the resurrection gives power to the to baptism because in the resurrection, Jesus was proved to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. And He is now ruling and reigning at the right hand of God, sitting on the throne of David, ruling in His kingdom, having angels, authorities, and powers subject to Him. He is Lord of lords and King of kings. And we need to have Christ as our King. We need to set him apart, as Peter said, as Lord in our lives, as our master. Christians will suffer for that. People will suffer as they commit themselves to the Lord. But in the end, they will be delivered just as Noah and his family were delivered. The question is, is that you? Are you willing to commit your life to Christ, fully submitting to Him in all things, that when the judgment comes, you will be delivered in that day? If we can help you, if we can assist you in that, please reach out and let us know. Thank you for watching The Word and Sword brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ, located in Newton, North Carolina. Our aim is to assist you to gain a better understanding of God's Word and encourage you to follow the Lord in all things. Do you want to study more about God's Word, His saving plan for man, and the church Jesus established? Please let us know, and we are happy to provide you with materials for additional study. Call and request a correspondence course that will be sent via U.S. mail, or to be added to the church's quarterly mail-out of the bulletin, or a copy of the outlines of our lessons. Call us at 828-465-3009. Again, that number is 828-465-3009. Thy presence, my light. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father, and I thy true Son. Thou in me dwelling, and I with thee one. Be thou my buckler, my sword for the fight. Be thou my dignity, thou my delight.